we're excited now to introduce our final speaker for this session. And I will just note that uh, uh, we'll start our next session a little bit late. Uh, please don't panic while we uh, hear what uh, Jenny's prepared. But we're, we're excited to hear from you, Jenny. Thank you so, so much for being with us today. We are, we're really excited. Jenny has over 25 years of experience as an attorney and an advisor for mission-driven enterprises. She has helped her clients raise millions of dollars from values-aligned investors and raised over $2 million from her own, for her own businesses. She is the author of Raise Capital on Your Own Terms, How to Fund Your Business Without Selling Your Soul, J Jenny earned her JD from uh, Yale Law School and a master's degree in city and regional planning from the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, Jenny, take it away. Thank you. I'm super excited to be here talking about this. I just want to quickly share my background in this uh, in this work. So. Uh, back in 2006, I became a securities lawyer, um, mostly because I was really passionate about helping small businesses. So I ended up doing some research and I found out that it is it was absolutely possible to do crowdfunding back then. In fact, one of the most famous crowdfunding campaigns that ever happened was in 1984. Ben and Jerry's, when they first started out, did crowdfunding to raise money for their first uh factory. But uh, the difference between then and now is back then you had to do state by state compliance. And so I helped many of my clients in many different states go through that process and it could be incredibly onerous. You had to go back and forth with the regulators and get their approval. And of course, if you, I had one client that wanted to raise in 16 states. So that was super onerous. We had to get approval from all 16. So, um, this was very frustrating. So in 2009, I co-founded a nonprofit. Aside from my law firm practice, I co-founded a nonprofit called Sustainable Economies Law Center. And one of the very first things we did in 2010 was we submitted a petition to the Securities and Exchange Commission to change the law to have a, a national federal exemption that would allow it, allow small businesses to raise money without having to do this state this very onerous expensive state by state compliance and i'm going to quick i'm going to tell you the story about that um in a minute a little bit more but um i just want to say that i i was asked to sp to talk specifically about uh what uh, women and non-binary folks need to know about crowdfunding so i do want to focus on um raising money for businesses that are not um, necessarily the ones that have a lot of the privileges. We have a long history of structural racism and sexism. I mean, I was alive at a time when women couldn't even have their own credit cards or bank accounts. So, and obviously, I mean, the structural racism is, uh, it's a long story that many of us are aware of. The 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 gap in wealth between homes, uh, between uh, households of color and white households is insane. So these are all con the context we need to be thinking about when we're talking about the finance ecosystem ecosystem and crowdfunding is part of the finance ecosystem. So I just want to quickly share my screen. I'm going to share some slides. Um, let's see. Okay. Uh, start. Okay. And, you know, I know this is a lot of words, but feel free to screen shot this because this is some interesting information. I'll just quickly go over it. So when you think about it, um, there are trillions and trillions of dollars that we as Americans have invested in the capital markets, but almost all of it is invested in public companies. And public companies make up about one about 0.1% of all the companies in our country. So almost all of the capital that is invested in our country is invested in about 4,000 companies on Wall Street. And that is part of the reason why there's such a lack of capital for small businesses, because there's just such a mismatch of, of capital uh, going to such a small number of companies. Um, if women entrepreneurs had the same access to capital as men, the economy would create an additional uh, 6 million jobs over the next five years. New Black-owned businesses start with almost three times less capital than new white-owned businesses. Black entrepreneurs' loan requests are three times less likely to be approved than those of white entrepreneurs. And according to one statistic I've seen, 83% of businesses in our country do not have access to bank loans or venture capital. Another thing I did want to mention um, 
we were talking, there was a question raised of why aren't more women raising money on Reg A? Well, only 4.2% of women-owned businesses have over a million dollar in rev million dollars in revenue. So we're talking quite small businesses. Now, does that mean they're bad businesses or loser businesses? No, a million dollar business can be quite profitable and can pay good returns to investors. Big does not necessarily equate with profitable. Some of our least profitable businesses are our biggest businesses. So in fact, small businesses on average are more profitable. So there's nothing wrong with being a small business, but why did I work so hard to advocate for this change to the law? It wasn't to help those folks that already have access to so much capital that are all get, already getting VC money and like, oh, we're going to do a community round now and we're going to, we have our VCs and angels already, but oh, we want to let our community invest. No, the reason and I fought so hard to get this law passed was to help those huge numbers of businesses that are not VC backable, those 83% that don't have access to bank loans or venture capital. So uh, I think I would love to, you know, really make sure as the v as the crowdfunding industry starts to focus more and more on the high growth tech startups and the, and the VC backed and VC backable companies, I don't want to forget that that is a very small minority of companies and we're not going to address the big problems in our country if we just try if we just now send yet more funding towards that those folks. Um, so, uh, and of course, a lot of the platforms and people in the industry are now focusing on that world because it is highly profitable for them. It's not as profitable to help someone raise 100,000 as it is to help someone raise 5 million. But I really think we need to focus on those smaller businesses that need a lot more help. So I, this is just a picture of the petition we submitted. You can see it says Jenny Kasson Sustainable Economies Law Center, July 1st, 2010. That was the petition that was submitted to the SEC. We kind of did it on a lark. We didn't think anything would happen. But amazingly enough, it did start to get some attention. 150 letters of support were submitted via the SEC website. Um, one of the, uh, uh, a member of Congress, Representative Issa, wrote a letter to the SEC chair at the time, and, there, and he was like, hey, there's this petition that was submitted by this group called Sustainable Economies Law Center. Why don't you, you know, pay attention to that? You can see it says the petition has received almost 150 comment letters, you know, all in favor. So, there, it started to get some attention. Um, of course, Mary Shapiro, the SEC chair at the time, like shut it down very quickly. And she was just like, oh, no, no, we would never do that. <laughs> That's We need to protect investors. But amazingly enough, it started getting some attention from President Obama. Um, he talked about it on this website that he had. Um, and then amazing, you know, it, uh, it took a couple years, but it did go to Congress. Finally, it passed. Um, 345 to 10 in its original version. Um, so that was amazingly exciting that we submitted a petition and two years later, I was also at the White House signing ceremony, um, which was amazing. So, but of course, we, many of you know, it took four years for the rules to go into effect. And um, as excited as I was about this new law, the results have been mixed for the people that I was most hoping would be helped by it. So, this is a, a data set, and I bet King's Crowd probably has a much more up-to-date data set than this, but this is one data set that I, I've seen um, looking at the results uh, of crowdfunding um, for women and people of color-owned companies. And so you can see the first circle, it says 68% of all businesses that are raised, that have raised money are successfully funded and raising an average of 161,000. I know that's low compared to what the average is now, but then it says, oh wow, 76% of women-owned businesses were successful. That's a lot more than the average. And then minority-owned, 73%. Wow, so they're doing better in terms of success rates than the average. That's amazing because compared to the venture capital uh, ecosystem where they're getting like, you know, two, 3% of the funding, they're actually having a higher success rate. However, if you dive a little deeper into the numbers, you'll see that the average they're raising is only about a third of what the average uh, of all campaigns are raising. So there's still some challenges. And I'll be honest with you, I actually co-founded a crowdfunding platform that is focused on mission-driven small businesses, women and minority-owned 
uh, Main Street style businesses, and we have seen quite a few of them not be successful. Um, so we have been really trying to figure out what is it going to take for these businesses to successfully raise money using investment crowdfunding. And we've come up with some ideas of things that we think would be incredibly helpful if we really want to take seriously the idea that that regulation crowdfunding is a way to support these kinds of businesses who really need this capital. I mean, they are struggling. There's a crisis of lack of capital among these businesses. And as long as they don't have access to capital, it's hurting our communities because our small businesses in our cities and neighborhoods are hurting. It's it, it prevents job creation. It's it put, you know, it puts families at risk when, when entrepreneurs try to create these businesses and they just can't make it because of lack of capital. So if we really want to see a major change in the tax base, the number of jobs, the number of economic vitality that we have in our communities, we have to take this seriously. So some of the things that we think would really help is having a physical gathering space where entrepreneurs can meet investors. And of course, this might not be so appropriate if, you're, if your business is more of like a national platform, but if you have like a bridal shop or a restaurant, having a place where you can come and show what you sell and give people samples and just get to know them, it, we really think that will result in more money moving, um, you know, trust me moves at this what is it uh change moves at the speed of trust i think is the is the uh, quote you need to build trust for someone to be able to invest as someone mentioned before there's high bounce rates when people go to invest go to a crowdfunding platform they often very quickly bounce off without actually investing because it you have to enter your social security number there it's a it's a process so you have to really trust that this is like a legit thing um, we need community financial education and organizing so that regular folks can learn what it means to make an investment in their own community. You know, if let's say I have the average household has about, I think, about 350000 in um, in investments. Um, what if I took 3% of that and invested in my in a small business in my local community or a few uh, via crowdfunding? What do I need to know to have the confidence to do that and do that well? So we need some education and also just to help people even understand that it's an option because still very few people are participating in crowdfunding. We need a lot of support for the entrepreneurs. For anyone who listened to Sarah Hanks earlier, you know that it is a pretty darn complicated law um, and the regs are very complicated, very challenging to comply with. Unfortunately, a lot of the platforms aren't doing a great job of making sure the entrepreneurs are in compliance. So we need to be supporting these entrepreneurs to get their gap financials and to, you know, be remember to file their annual reports and all of that. I think having a locally branded investment platform can also really help when you're talking about community-based investing. We started one called um, Crowdfund Montana because we had a bunch of clients in Montana. Uh, we're looking at other communities, but it's really fun if you live in a particular place that you love to be able to go to a branded platform for that place. Uh, and then we think there's so much room for support from philanthropy and from impact investors, providing matching investments, guarantees. Um, the last I checked, philanthropists uh, have a big chunk of money that they don't have to make a financial return on at all. And so they can uh, provide guarantee funds that, you know, if things don't work out, they could use that money to pay back the community investors. And yes, the, the philanthropist would lose all that money, but that's okay because they actually are supposed to, you know, do 5%, at least 5% of their, uh, of their endowment towards those kinds of things. So these are the things that we think would be really helpful. Um, we're, we are starting up, sorry, we're starting a pilot in Baltimore um, in partnership with an organization called Maryland Neighborhood Exchange. I think the founder of that, Stephanie Geller, is speaking at this conference. She's done an amazing job of organizing the community in Baltimore to invest in small local businesses that are doing crowdfunding campaigns. We also bought this building to be a physical location in Baltimore where we can host events and help the community get to know um, 
local entrepreneurs that are raising money using crowdfunding. Uh, this is a picture of our Crowdfund Montana website. We hope to have one for Baltimore soon and possibly other communities. We're working with some small, uh, with some city governments and uh, nonprofits to develop some more locally branded platforms. Um, so that's that for my slide. So I'm happy to stop there because I know we're a bit over time. Wow. Thank you so much, uh, Jenny. You are you are great, and I, I apologize for uh, rushing you, but uh, we are grateful for the time that you took with us, and I uh, really appreciate you being here. This has just been a fantastic session.